Amen. You may be seated. As you notice, I have reverted back to this. I'm tired of using that other thing and it driving me crazy. So I've reverted back to this. So until we can find something that works, it, I'm back to the old. This is the old way, I guess. <laughs> the old way. Amen. A family was sitting down to dinner, and they, of course, as every family does, they had one little boy in the family. It was quite the precocious little boy, just never knew what he was going to do, never knew what he was going to say. He was just always getting into something, always saying something that was kind of, kind of not, not in place and so forth. So the family was always kind of very, very... We are very just nervous, good word, very nervous of what he was going to do. And so they were, they were sitting down there, and they had some guests at the table. So they uh, were having dinner, and the young man turned to his dad, and he said, Dad, is it good to eat bugs? Well, immediately his dad's mind just goes to, to other things that's happened, and he's He's picturing him pulling bugs out of his pocket, putting them in his mouth. And he's, he's just picturing all kinds of things his son, his son could do over the next couple minutes following that question. And, and so he says, now, son, that's not an appropriate question at the table. We're not going to talk about that. You just, you just go on and eat your dinner and let's be quiet. But, Dad, no, son, go ahead. You just sit and eat your dinner. Don't, don't do anything. Just, just please just, just be quiet and eat your dinner. And so the little boy listened, and he went on to eat his dinner. Well, after dinner, they were sitting in the living room, and his father was thinking, maybe I was a little hard on him. Maybe I, maybe I would jump to a conclusion. So he said, he said um, son, what was that question you asked me at the dinner table? And the little boy said, uh, Dad, it was, uh, is it okay to eat bugs? And he said, well, is there a reason that you, you asked me that? And he said, well, it's not important now. <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, what do you mean it's not important now? Well, Dad, there was a fly in your suit. <laughs> but it's gone now. <laughs> Maybe sometimes we need to listen a little more. What do you think? All right, Luke chapter 8. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. This has been family month. We've had a great family month, haven't we? It's been a wonderful family month. I've, been, I've really enjoyed the series that we've been doing on family month and talking the things we've been, we've been talking about uh, in family month. And so uh, we're coming to the end today, and today, uh, this morning, uh, teaching the last of the series on family month. And then, of course, uh, later today in the service, I want to pray God's blessing on our families. So I want to read from Luke chapter 8, and it's several verses, so if you'd bear with me for a moment, from 40 to 56 in the 8th chapter of the book of Luke. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. A ruler of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood staunched or stopped. Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude." Throng thee, press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. I hope by the time we get to the end of our services today, God says, Somebody touched me. 
Verse 47 says, And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling. Falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. He said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in him, save Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, took her by the hand, called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them, that they should tell no man what was done. We've talked over the past few weeks, we talked the first week about godly families and having godly families. Second week, we talked about building a rock-solid marriage, a, a relationship, rock-solid uh, marriage between a husband and a wife. Last week, we talked about an ounce of prevention, keeping your kids in church. Raising your kids so that they, so that they love God and, and love the church. But with all of that, with, with, with all of that, we still have imperfect families. With all of that, with, with, with striving to have a godly home, working to have a solid marriage, working very hard to raise your kids so that they love the church and they love God and they understand that there's a refuge and a place of safety in the church. With all of that, and families can be wonderful. Families can absolutely be wonderful. I love my family. We have a great time, my family. But families can also be tribulation. Families can also be tribulation. One family one time came to me, and by the time they left, I felt like they were going through the great tribulation. Family's messy. It's messy. We live in a broken world. We live in a sinful world. And in a sinful world, sin causes a mess. And because we live in a sinful world, and everybody wants a perfect family. We want Father's Knows Best. Anybody remember that? That show? You, you younger folks wouldn't remember it. <clears throat> Did you? Everybody wants Father's Knows Best. But a lot of times it's more like The Simpsons. Or married with children or something like that. And I don't watch either one of those. I just, I just know the, the context of, of what those shows are. And, and, and so a lot of times it's like that in families. Because there is brokenness in some families. There, there's things that don't always work the way we want them to. There's things that happen. That, that happen in our families that cause hurt and cause, cause division and brokenness to come to our homes. And so, so we, have to, we have to understand that while we are striving for a godly home, and you can, you can have one of the most godly homes, you can have, a, 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 have done everything right, and you can still have brokenness in your family. Because we live in a sinful world. Because we are born with a sinful nature. And, and, and so we, we think about that, and the Scripture is not silent about it. The Scripture is not silent about, about trouble in, in the family. 
The very first family God created was Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve blatantly disobeyed God. Now, folks, they didn't just disobey God. They disobeyed God in a perfect environment. There was no sin in the world when they disobeyed God. There was, there, there, there was no strife. There was no jealousy. There was none of that in the world, and yet they failed and they disobeyed God. And that one act of disobedience has brought so much trouble and so much strife and so much brokenness to our world. That one act of disobeying God. And then, not only that, but they have two sons, Cain and Abel. And Cain kills his brother. So you've got, you've got a, a disobedient, disobedient parents, a murderous son. You read on in Scripture, and you've got Sarah, Sarah who's grieving because she, she can't have children. They've been promised a child. She can't have a child. So her... So her <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So her answer to this is Hagar, who is her servant, why don't you become the surrogate mother and you go in unto Abraham and, and you conceive and, and we'll have a son? And that's exactly what happens. Ishmael's born. And what happens? Sarah abuses Hagar because she's so jealous. Because of Ishmael. And what does the man of the house do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He's just passive through it all. He, does, he, doesn't, he doesn't raise his voice. He doesn't, he doesn't say, wait a minute, this, this all came because what you wanted. No, he just, nothing. And then you've got Lot, Lot, who, who didn't want to leave that sexually perverted Sodom. He wanted to stay, keep his family in, in, in Sodom uh, so much that it was almost like the angels had to drag him out of Sodom. And then weeks later, now, folks, this, this is Scripture. This, it's, I'm just telling you what happened in history, in the Bible. Weeks later, his daughters seduce him. You think you got family problems. You think that, that your, family, your family's messed up. You got, you got Jacob or, or Isaac and Rebekah who play favorites with Jacob and Esau. Esau's Isaac's favorite. Jacob's Rebecca's favorite. They plot against each other. And Esau has no discernment, so he sells his birthright to his brother, grieves his parents because he marries a Canaanite woman, and then carries a 20 year murderous grudge against his brother. The Bible is not silent in that we have issues in families, that things happen in families, that, that things transpire that bring hurt, hurt and brokenness into the family. I could go on. There's more, but I'm not. I think you get the idea that the Bible is very clear and doesn't hide that man is sinful. And it doesn't try to paint the perfect picture, the perfect family. Because even families that were chosen by God had problems. Even families that God had called for a specific purpose had problems. Had issues in the family. 
Why, why are you telling us all of this? Because I want you to understand, because we can get the idea sometimes that we have failed God in one way or another, and we haven't done exactly what we're supposed to do when we've done everything right, and yet something happens with our kids, or something happens in our family, and all of a sudden we're dealing with the guilt of, of what, what didn't we do? Why didn't we, why didn't we do this? What could we have done better? And, and we've got to understand that that sin is sin, and sometimes sin comes in even to the best of families. And we have to, we have to sometimes deal with that, that our families hurt. I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about divorced or separated families. That's definitely a segment of it. That's definitely a part of it. But I'm talking about families that have endured abuse, Families that have, have, have uh, emotional hurts, uh, that have dealt with addiction, things that have affected the home, things that, that have hurt the home. Or, or, or maybe, we're talking, maybe, maybe we're talking about a prodigal and a family's waiting for a prodigal, prodigal son or a prodigal daughter to come home. And, 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 you're, and you're worried about that. Or maybe there's distance, not necessarily miles, but distance between, between a child and the parents or between a husband and a wife. And so we have to understand that, that sometimes our families become messed up. And folks, there's plenty of hurt to go around. I, somebody said one time, uh, they said, well, I wish my family was like such and such a family. And, and I was sitting there and I was thinking, you have no idea what that family's going through. You see the outside and you see, you see, you see the, 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 uh, what, they, what they do at church and you see the worship and, and, and you see their faithfulness and commitment. But, but that faithfulness and that worship is costing them something because right now their family is going through the storm. So you don't always see what's happening on the other side of the walls of that house. And there's a lot of times uh, there's, there's so much hurt. Life hurts. But let me tell you something. God heals. Life hurts, but God heals. I want to tell you there's hope for the hurting family. There is hope for the hurting family. I don't care what has happened in your home, in your family, what kind of brokenness that you have come out of, what kind of situations you've had to deal with, what kind of things have happened to you in your life. There is healing from God. God is interested in your pain. God cares about your pain because that is not the way God planned it. God planned a perfect, excuse me, a perfect place. God planned a, a garden where, where he could commune with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. God, God planned a place where there was no pain, no sorrow. He, that was his plan. That was creation. That was the way that God made it. But yet sin entered the world. So now we have to deal with that. And yes, life hurts, but God heals. God heals. And God is interested in your pain. The great thing about it is the day will come when God will restore. Put Revelation 21 up. The day will come when, when God will Restore. We'll go back to what God had originally created. The Bible says uh, in John's revelation, he said, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears. Life hurts, but God heals. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, and neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. We're going to, we're going to endure some pain and some suffering on this side of glory. 
But if you are born again of water and spirit and you're living a faithful life to God, if you're committed to God, if you're walking with God and you're striving on with God, there is a promise that there, there, there will come a day where there will be no more pain and there will be no more broken homes and no more sorrow and no more hurt families. There, there, that's the plan of God. That's, that's what God is. What God cares that you're hurting. God cares that you're hurting. Ex Exodus chapter 3 and the seventh verse. The Bible says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. He said, I've, I've seen it. I've seen what my people are going through. I've seen their pain. I've seen the hurt. I've seen, I've seen what families are enduring today. I, I, I've seen what families are, are having to deal with today and all the, all the things that, that are coming to, to our homes. He said, I've seen all that. I've heard it when they've cried, when you have stepped into the corner of your house and you've got down on your knees before God and, and you've cried out to God. God said, I hear the cry when you have prayed and you didn't think anybody was listening. I, I heard your cry. I understand your pain. He said, I know your sorrows. It's interesting. It's interesting here that God says, I know your sorrows. But in Isaiah, when Isaiah wrote the prophecy of Christ coming, Messiah coming, he said, he didn't say, I know your sorrows. He said, I carried your sorrows. I carried your sorrows. Here, I know your sorrows. But after Calvary, at Calvary, at Calvary, God carried your sorrows sorrows, every sorrow, every brokenness, every hurt, everything that you have felt, everything that, that has happened in your family, your home, your life, whatever has brought hurt to you, God has already carried that. God has already put that on his shoulders and carried it to a cross. He took it. He knew their sorrows, but he carried yours. Verse 8 says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey and to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. I am come down to deliver them. Isaiah 49, verse 14 says, But Zion said, this is what the church said, But Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. You ever felt like that? You ever been through the trial that, that, that you felt like God did not know where you were? That God did just, just well, he, may, he, may, he may even know where you are, but God, God's kind of distant. You ever been through that trial where, where, where you've wondered, where's God in the midst of this? Where's God in my sorrow? Where's God in my pain? Where's God in my hurt? Where's God when my family is broken and falling apart? Where, where's God in all of this? Verse 15 is God's response to, the, to what Zion said. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb, yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee? It may be so that a mother may forget her child, but I won't forget you. Verse 16, behold, I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Don't you ever think God has forsaken you. Don't ever let the devil or you get so covered up in your storm or, or what's going on 
in, in, in your life or, or, or in your family that you think that God has forgotten you. I will not forget you, he said. I will not forget you. I've got you engraved on the palm of my hand. We read in Luke, chapter Luke about two people, two people that were hurting. In fact, the, the hurt would have not just affected them, but it would have affected their family. Jarius, his daughter, would affect the whole family, not just Jarius, not just his daughter. When he, when he went to the house, he made sure that Jairus and his mother went in with him. This was, not, this was not an individual thing. It's a family thing. The woman, the woman who came and pressed her way through the crowd, it didn't just affect her. Because her issue of blood, she would have been considered unclean. So she would have been put out of her home. She was no longer able to go to the temple to worship. It affected her spiritually. It affected her relationally. So it affected the family. This, this was a family issue. It was a family hurt. And Jesus is showing up at Capernaum. and He's met by the crowd of people who've been waiting for him. And one man in the crowd, Jairus, he makes sure he gets up to Jesus and he begins to tell him, he's a ruler of the synagogue. This man has authority. He is a spiritual man. Of course, we understand at that time that the rulers of the synagogue and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were diametrically opposed to Jesus. And yet this ruler broke rank. He, bro he broke rank. He, he stepped out beyond, beyond the walls and the confines of, of his religiosity to come to Jesus, this, this ruler of the synagogue, an important man, a, a man of position in the church, respected. People would have looked up to him. People would have, would have honored him. But he was hurting. His family was hurting. And when the religion of the synagogue couldn't answer, when the religion of the synagogue could not help his daughter, he was willing to step out of that. Let me tell you something about hurt and pain. Hurt and pain doesn't care whether you're rich or poor. Hurt and pain doesn't care if you're good or bad. Doesn't care whether you're religious or not religious. It rains on the just and the unjust. Pain, does, pain is no respecter of persons. And, 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 and this man, this respectable man, this man of position and authority whose daughter was sick and dying, it was his only daughter we learned. She was 12 years old. It's interesting, she was 12, and the woman who pressed through the crowd had been sick for 12 years. I find that quite interesting. But Jarius, I don't think Jarius gave it a second thought. I don't think Jarius, Jarius had to think twice about what he had to do when he went and literally threw himself at the feet of Jesus, this man of respectability. This man of authority, this man of power threw himself at the feet of Jesus, begging him to come and heal my daughter, the ruler of the synagogue. Asking Jesus for help. He was not embarrassed. Let me tell you something. Hurt, hurt will make you do things when you're desperate You'll do things you normally wouldn't do. 
when you when your family's hurting and your family's broken and your family's in 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 in, in trouble he he was willing to cast aside his religious robes he was willing to step outside of his religious bag he was willing to go beyond that to get to Jesus because Jesus was now his only hope Jesus was the one that was going to help heal his family and he come and threw himself at the feet. He didn't care what his friends would say. He didn't care what other people would say. He came to Jesus. Because at the end of the day, Jesus was his only hope. Jesus was his only hope. And folks, let me tell you, Jesus is interested in helping you. He cares Jesus cares, and he cares when your family is broken, and he cares when you're hurting, and he cares when, when there's trouble. And, of course, Jesus agreed, I'll go. I'll go. And they started to make their way through those streets with the crowd surrounding them on their way to Jairus' house and, and, and everybody thronging Jesus, all of them wanting to see another miracle, all of them wanting to see God do something else. All of them there because, because they were expecting something. They had been waiting for a miracle in that city and everybody bumping up against him. And I'm sure the progress was slow. I'm sure Jerry has kind of thought, I wish we could speed this up a little bit. Maybe somebody yell fire and we can go. We, we, we can get to my house a little quicker. Something, something got to happen. And all of a sudden, they're, they're walking through the crowd. And while they're at least making a little progress, all of a sudden, Jesus comes to a stop. Sudden stop. And Jesus asks the question, who touched me? Well, that's an easy answer. Everybody touched you. You got hundreds of people surrounding you. You got people rubbing against you. You got people putting their hands on you. You got you got you got people doing this and that. And 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 and, and everybody's touching you. No, somebody touched me. I want God not just to touch me today. I want him to touch me. I want I want something that God would, would give. I want I want God to impart something to me today. I want God to impart something to you today that God would touch you. He said somebody touch me because I felt virtue. I felt power go out of me. Somebody touched me with faith. Somebody touched me with faith. Somebody came hurting. Somebody came broken. Somebody came with a need and somebody touched me. And you got the woman who's laid there at the feet of Jesus and you got Jairus who's standing there impatiently. Jesus, this is not the time. This is not the time. We need to go. My daughter is desperate for a healing and we need to go. Who touched me? And in that crowd along with Jairus was that woman whose faith said if I could just touch the hem of his garment if I could just touch the hem, if I can get within arm's reach and just touch the hem, I will be healed. The contrast between these two people and the brokenness in their families. One was prominent. The other was anonymous. One was religious. And the other her condition kept her from worshiping. Jarius made it public. Hers deeply private. But it didn't matter because Jesus was there for both of them. It didn't matter the difference in their circumstances. Jesus was there for them. This woman, she didn't come to be seen. Matter of fact, she preferred not to be seen. She wanted to get in, get her healing, and get out. She wanted, she didn't want any attention. So she touched him. And Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? The woman tried to get away, healed she was healed from her hurt, but she was trying to get away. 
but she could not even get away. Who touched me? Because he felt power go out from him. This woman got her healing, but that leaves Jairus. And Jairus is standing there waiting, waiting, waiting. We've got to go. We've got to go. And while they're waiting, comes a servant from Jairus' house who looks at him and said, don't trouble the master anymore. There's no need to bother him anymore. Your daughter is dead. Could you imagine the blow to Jairus' faith at that moment? They were on their way to his house. They were going in the direction of his house. If Jesus had come back a day earlier, now it's too late for anything to happen. But that didn't turn Jesus back. Aren't you glad nothing shakes Jesus up? Aren't you glad whatever's got you all shook up doesn't shake Jesus up? He said, I, I, I'll just, let's just keep going, Jarius. There's no need to stop now. If we'll go to your house, your daughter will be made whole. Let's, let's, let's just keep going. Let me tell you something, folks. Don't give up on God. Do not give up on God when you think it's over. Don't give up on God. I think there's too many folks when they don't see something happen, they just kind of give up and, and kind of move on. They say, well, okay, well, I'll just settle for this and I'll just go on. Folks, don't give up. Don't give up on God. Keep believing God no matter how bad the situation is, no matter how, how troubled your family is. We need to keep trusting. You've got to keep trusting Jesus. You've got to keep leaning on Jesus through every disaster, through every problem. God cares about your broken family. He cares about the hurt that's in your family. Don't give up on God. And even though Jerry's situation seemed to get worse, seemed to get as bad as it could get, been in those kind of situations too, haven't we? We've been in situations that seem like it could not get any worse than what it is right now. Yet Jarius, Jarius kept trusting. Jarius said, okay, let's go. And Jarius kept walking. And Jesus gets to Jarius' house. And he only takes a few in with him. Peter, James, and John. He takes the, those three in with him. And, and they, they walk into Jarius' house. And there's some folks in there, and they're mourning. Oh, they're mourning. It's, 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 it was weeping and crying and all this stuff around, around Jairus' around daughter. They, they were mourning everything that was going on. They were, they were mourning everything that was happening in the home. And, and Jesus comes in, and he, he says, oh, she's not dead. She's not dead. She's only asleep. She's not dead. She's only asleep. You know what? What we call dead, Jesus is called sleeping. It's to, to, we, call it, we call it permanent. Jesus calls it temporary. And Jesus walks into Jairus' house, into this broken situation, in this broken family, and he walks in there and he tells them, weep not because she, she's not dead. She, she's only asleep. And, of course, they just kind of laugh him to scorn. But Jesus, Jesus puts them all out. He said, if you can't believe, get out. If you don't have faith, get out. You, you just step out right now. If you cannot believe with me for a miracle right here and right now, put them out. And they put them all out. And the Bible says he took her by the hand and he said, "Maid, arise. And that moment her spirit came into her again. Some people, some people say, well, she wasn't dead anyway. She's asleep and that's why Jesus said that. No, the Bible says her spirit came back into her. She had to be dead. She was dead and her spirit came back into her. And God raised her from the dead because they wouldn't give up. They kept believing. Let me tell you, never give up. You need to keep believing for your family. Family. You need to keep believing for your kids, for the prodigal, for the backslidden. You need to keep trusting God and believing them to come back to get back to church, to get back right with God. Because Jesus cares about your pain. He cares 
about your hurt and the brokenness of your families. And don't, don't let somebody else dissuade you. Don't let somebody else try, try to talk you out of believing. Don't, don't be embarrassed when your family's going through trouble. If I had every family in here stand right now that has never had trouble in your family, there's not one of you that'd stand up because we've all had it. We've all had trouble. We have some of it we weren't prepared for. Some of it we, we, we didn't see it coming. It blindsided us. From, from It came out of left field, and we did not see it coming. But we still had trouble. Don't let people try to dissuade you from getting to Jesus. Jarius knew that Jesus could help and that Jesus would help him through his hurts because Jesus offers healing. I have come to heal the brokenhearted, he said. I've come to restore sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. He said, I've come, I've come with healing and the power of healing. Folks, it's in Jesus alone. It's in Jesus. Now, I, I don't discourage counseling. I think counseling is good and counseling is important. And, and, and we depend a lot on counseling. I do counseling. We, we, we do that, and that's important. But ultimately, the healing has to be done in here. It has to be done on the inside. Sometimes it takes being willing to forgive. Easier said than done. Sometimes you got to be willing to forgive. Sometimes you got you got to be willing to 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 go the extra mile. If you got two coats, give them one. Sometimes you got to you got to go the extra mile. You got to give a little more than what they're willing willing to give. But ultimately, the healing comes from God. And we have to allow God to work in our lives. And we can't give up on God. We've got to allow God to work in our lives and in our families and in our home. Because our ultimate hope is heaven where there is no more pain. Where there is no more sorrow. You don't have to raise your hands to this question, but let me ask you today. Is your family hurting? Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't respond. I'm asking you, is your family hurting? I pray today that in this service, that today you bring it to God and you give it to God and allow God to work in the situation. Allow God to work. Pray over it. Keep praying about it. Never give up, but give it to Why don't you stand with me right now? Let's stand. I know, I know because, and it's not because anybody's told me. It's not even because God told me. I just know because we're here today and there's people in here. And because of that, because of that, I know that people have come with burdens. It just happens. It's life. It's life. We come weighed down. We come struggling. We come with issues. We come with, with broken families and hurting families. We come. We come with burdens in this place. And, and some of you are burdened because your children are backslidden away from God. And we need to give them to Jesus. We need to give them to Jesus. We need to, he said, I carried your sorrows. We need to give them to Jesus. We need to let him have him. Because God truly understands. He really does. God truly understands. Could we do that right now? Let's pray. Jesus, God, in your great name, Lord, we come before you. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, as we've gathered in your name today. That, <laughs> that God, you do understand our hurt. And you do understand our pain. 
And God, you understand the trouble that we're going through. And I pray today, God, in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, you would work today in our families. God, we surrender our families to you. We give our situations, our lost children, our, our, our broken broken relationships. God, we give them to you today. We surrender them, Lord, and lay them upon the altar of God. And we pray today, oh God, and Lord, we will press through a crowd if we have to. We're not going to worry about what somebody thinks. We're not going to worry about what somebody says. God, because we need you to touch